These questions have sparked the development of novel technologies, publications, and patents that prove low carbon building solutions through material innovation. Jonathan's research has gained significant recognition through numerous funding awards, including the Harvard Climate Change Solutions Fund, the Department of Energy Advanced Building and Construction Program, and the WISH Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering Validation Project Program. He holds degrees in architecture and building science from Virginia Tech and a doctor of design degree from the GSD. Welcome, Jonathan. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you to the PSA for having me. Um, I'm going to jump into the content, which I think is going to get uh, a little technical at times, maybe, maybe for a typical architecture talk. Uh, and I'll try to kind of leave time at the end so that we can discuss it. Uh, but today I want to talk about uh, feeling good with low carbon cooling systems. Um, and as uh, Jeff's introduction kind of uh, outlined, much of the research I do is about a very kind of highly dis uh, cross-disciplinary research that asks kind of what is happening in the sciences uh, and how can we translate these kind of new and novel uh, material discoveries towards the uh, ideas in the built environment about drawing down carbon, especially around uh, the topic of today, kind of cooling systems. Um, so I, re I lead a research group uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where I teach. I'm also a core faculty member at the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities. Uh, my research uh, is through the Wiest Institute and also collaborates with the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and, uh, and Sciences. Uh, and so when, as I was thinking about this talk, I kind of wanted to step back and say, why do I want to feel good about uh, low carbon cooling systems. And part of it is that uh, as a career wise, I did start out uh, very much in a typical kind of architecture space, looking at things uh, around environmentalism and especially technologies and, and, and how we're using them in the built environment. Uh, and so on the left is a project that I collaborated with in the mass uh, design group back uh, about 10 years ago, uh, looking at the cholera treatment center in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, and that's a kind of classic architecture uh, in, in the typical sense. Uh, but just yesterday on the right is kind of what I was doing, which was specking valves and NPT and, and different kind of hardware for a cooling system. And the question is, how do you go from a uh, typical kind of architecture process into this very kind of more engineered system? And why does that matter? And I think it's because we have serious climate issues to take on in the built environment. Uh, and that also requires a bit about uh, seriousness about how do we bring these technologies to market uh, to actually have uh, a major impact uh, on the world. Uh, and that impact matters because we know, I think it's way too obvious today, we were constantly kind of inundated with uh, the, the impacts of climate, uh, but we know the world is getting hotter. Uh, we know that in the areas where it's getting hotter, it's getting wetter. Uh, and we're going to see kind of a uh, a triple uh, or a threefold increase in cooling demand globally uh, and in kind of the equatorial region that that cooling demand is going to grow by tenfold all by 2050 as kind of wealth increases uh, and populations have more and more access to these technologies. Uh, and we're also seeing that in, in our kind of digital world as we think about this, I, this kind of former idea of dematerialization, uh, all of this computing that we're doing is also driving an incredible amount of cooling demand, and that's only going to grow. Uh, and if I mention the word cooling, uh, I think we typically have a mentality of uh, what is the set point of a, th a thermostat? How much, uh, how cool do we want that environment to be? Uh, but cooling is really a combination of many different factors. And when we start to think about cooling relative to climate change, uh, the actual impact of our cooling decisions is not uh, just the temperature. It's actually this kind of threefold situation where temperature is generating about a third of the emissions. This is research that was uh, presented about a year ago by NREL. Uh, so if we think about the emissions related to uh, uh, cooling, about a third of it has come from the temperature, the actual energy use and the source uh, emissions at the power plant. Uh, a third of it is actually related to that in the humidity, and then the largest third of it is actually coming from the refrigerants we use. Uh, we effectively have been cooling uh, since Carrier invented cooling nearly 100 years ago, uh, using refrigerants, hydrofluorocarbons that have an incredibly large uh, global warming potential when they're released at the end of life. Uh, so what we're really getting at is this question that, yes, we're interested in cooling around the temperature, the kind of sensible cooling, 
Uh, but humidity, the latent heat in that uh, air and the refrigerants are making up a major chunk of our cooling demand, especially when we start to think about carbon emissions. Uh, and the work I'm looking at is how do we draw those down? Uh, because as mentioned, uh, the, the refrigerants we use that eventually kind of escape during the life of our typical uh, vapor compression cycle, and at the very end of that life cycle, uh, they have the potential to release upwards of 60 gigatons of CO2 equivalent uh, by 2050. And that 60 gigatons is effectively two years uh, of society's kind of annual emissions uh, just under that, or effectively over like 10% of our remaining budget if we want to keep uh, under 1.5 degrees Celsius, though that uh, is quickly escaping us. Uh, and so the question is, how do we do this? Uh, and what I tend to do is look back at an advert that was uh, generated in 1950s by Carrier. Uh, this is the unconditional surrender as they're trying to sell uh, the kind of post-war boom of vapor per compression cooling. And I start to think about what are the strategies we have, and I'll use this advert to kind of highlight some of the ones I'll talk about today. Uh, one thing that Carrier and our typical kind of AC unit does very well is that it's a retrofittable. So as we start to think about improving the technologies uh, in our buildings around cooling, we have to remain and think about how do we actually retrofit uh, existing buildings? How do we hold on to that existing embodied carbon? How do we design systems uh, that can be retrofit, especially as uh, areas start to, to, to warm? Uh, the other aspect we need to think about is the phys uh, physiological health of people. Uh, this advert's 1950s. Uh, we're not just cooling this man in a white collar job. We have to recognize that uh, the way we sense heat is a, or the way we sense uh, kind of comfort is, is a heat balance. How much heat are we losing to the environment? Uh, and how do we improve that? It's not just about the temperature, but it's about the way each and every one of us uh, loses and sheds heat to the environment. Uh, and so this ideas of different gender come into this, uh, histories come into this, different geographies will experience heat lofts in different ways. And we need to recognize that uh, not all heating and cooling is the same. Uh, and then within this advert, we also see that uh, carriers up against the fan, but today uh, we are seeing with uh, COVID a, a necessary increase in the amount of fresh air exchange we have in buildings. We're seeing new code coming on board that's doubling the requirements for fresh air. And so we want to think about cooling systems that can provide that fresh air, uh, but also cooling systems that can use the movement of air to actually cool us as well. Uh, and the last bit of it's a little sneaky, but it's the handkerchief that this man's using. And the two technologies that I'll introduce today are using water, water vapor, uh, as a primary way of cooling and dehumidifying uh, instead of the refrigerants I just spoke about. Um, so hopefully uh, in, the, in uh, the next part of this talk, I'm going to get through these three different projects that are all kind of taking on these questions I just discussed, thinking about retrofits, uh, thinking about new models of thermal health and comfort, uh, and thinking about how do we design the entire carbon life cycle. Um, so I'll jump right into it. And the first project is actually here on campus at Harvard, uh, and it's the headquarters of our Center for Green Buildings and Cities. This is uh, House Zero, which was designed by Snohetta, built by Skanska, and teamed with the Center for Green Buildings and Cities. Um, and so it was commissioned uh, or started construction back in 2016 and commissioned effectively right before COVID hit. Uh, and the house employs a number of different strategies around 100% natural ventilation, 100% uh, daylight autonomy, uh, incredibly uh, interesting ways of doing low he uh, heating and cooling uh, energy systems, uh, and then a, a particular awareness of the total carbon across the system. And I won't go into every piece of this. There's, there's plenty of literature on the house. What I want to focus on today to kind of frame this talk is, is the paper we released last year looking at the carbon balance of the building, how much carbon is being emitted by this building and how much can it offset. Uh, and so what this takes on is a question of how much CO2 emissions are embodied in the construction of the building. Uh, and we'll get into the system boundaries related to this, but we're asking by making this building, how much CO2 is emitted? And as we replenish certain aspects of the building over its entire life, uh, how much CO2 is emitted in that process? Uh, over the entire life, we're also gonna ask how much uh, CO2 is emitted in the operation of this building if we are drawing that energy directly from the grid. And that grid is of course in Massachusetts. Uh, and we're gonna say, how much of that uh, these emissions can actually be avoided by on-site renewables in the form of, of uh, 
uh, photovoltaic cells. And what does this all add up to at the end of, of the building's uh, life? And so within this process, working with scan uh, we develop a really, really highly articulated life cycle assessment uh, across the entire life cycle stages from the uh, A1 uh, through 5, which is the product transportation and construction, uh, B4, which is the replacement of different products in the building over their life cycle based off the different expected service life is of those products, and then the waste scenario of the building. Uh, and I've highlighted two numbers here. One of them uh, is the benchmark, which means that we're looking at how much CO2 is being emitted per square meter of construction. One of them is the number up until the end of construction phase, which is 233 grams or kilograms of CO2 per square meter. And the other one is 488. And these are disparately are very disparate numbers in terms of the calculation. Uh, and it becomes kind of a question of the system boundary that architects are using today to to uh, look at carbon emissions. Uh, and the reason for that is we typically now benchmark based off this really interesting work by Kate Simonin and, and Catherine De Wolf and others, looking at uh, different projects, about a, th a thousand different projects and asking what is the kind of median CO2 emissions uh, for the structure foundation and closure of these buildings. Uh, and that median comes out to about 384 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And if we go back up, we'll see that we, we have a number that's very low, 233, and a number that's kind of higher, 488. Uh, and the reason for this is that that 233 number does not include the full life cycle of the building. So if we're doing a typical benchmarking study today with our kind of contemporary architects, we're only looking at up to the construction and we're only really looking at the enclosure of the building. And what we've done with this study is we've looked at the entire life of the building, including the replacement of all of the different aspects of our construction. And we're including all of the kind of systems in the MEP that are typically not included in the standard uh, LCA and looking at the impact of these different systems, such as the heat pump, the solar arrays, the replacement of that solar array, and how much do they contribute to the carbon emissions. And in this case, we get to this much larger number, uh, but it's really important because we've expanded the system boundary in the study to include uh, the full life cycle assessment. And so if we look at this, it breaks down to kind of simple uh, chart where we can say the material system of a typical LCA is about 58%, and the other 42% in our scenario is the technical systems that are tend to be outside a normal system boundary for an LCA uh, that we're doing today for typical benchmarking. Uh, and so the quick takeaway is for these high-performing buildings, we may be missing up to 50% of these buildings' emissions, and many of that is related to the systems uh, around heating and cooling and, and an energy production on site. Uh, and to take the step, study one step further, we look at the life cycle emissions relative to the grid emissions uh, in the future. So we're looking at a number of different projections at the time of the construction, uh, looking at IEA projections, Obama era projections, all of the different projections uh, that institutes were having and saying, okay, well, we can look at the emissions that we've done for the embodied operation or embodied uh, construction of the building, but we have to understand what are the emissions from the operation gonna be as the grid around us starts to decarbonize. And so we look at these different scenarios. And in our case, we're building for this Obama era uh, scenario, uh, which is kind of a, a linear reduction to 2050 and then a flattening at around 100 uh, grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour uh, after 2050. Uh, we have a model of of our building, because this is an earlier study showing the, the total uh, EUI, the amount of energy use, and we convert that into CO2 on the, on the grid. Uh, and then we do a comparison. And what's kind of interesting here is we're comparing on the left side of this chart, uh, the embodied and, opera uh, and operational CO2 emissions. Uh, here we see that the embodied emissions are actually about 75% of the total emissions over the life of the building. And this is per year. Uh, and the operational are much smaller. It's a highly efficient building. Uh, and the amount we can offset by renewable generation on site in this case is larger year by year than the actual combined operational and embodied emissions when, you, when we annualize them. That's for this uh, scenario where we're gonna hit zero emissions uh, by 2050. However, we see an interesting fact here that if we do zero out our grid emissions by 2050, we don't have that same ability to offset because now the PVs are effectively at the same uh, emissions level that the grid is, zero emissions. And we see that, yes, we cut down the operational emissions related to that CO2 or by, related to the grid reduction, 
but fundamentally, we're not able to offset all of our emissions because the grid is clean. Uh, so it's a very kind of interesting scenario here to think about when we're talking about decarbonization to say that if we can hit zero emissions, uh, it's very unlikely that we can actually say that any architecture can be offset or zero emissions in the future. And so the major takeaway from this study is that as more precise data become available for building systems beyond the typical system boundary of current LCA methods, uh, it's possible that achieving net zero uh, carbon balance will become more difficult across the building sector as the complete understanding of our CO2 emissions uh, contributed by buildings uh, and building systems becomes more well understood. So fundamentally, as we as architects declare net zero, the more information we can provide about the emissions from our buildings, uh, the more likely it will become that we may actually not be able to achieve this. And when we, of course, we can get into a discussion at the end about what exactly this means. Uh, but using this project as kind of a framework to say, you know, where are our emissions coming from? I want to step into two technologies that we're developing in the lab uh, that eventually will be launching around a really low, cool, low carbon cooling system. Uh, and so the first technology, uh, I should update this, is C-SNAP. We can't use cold snap anymore. This is an old slide. Uh, but this is a rationally controlled barrier layer for indirect evaporative cooling. Uh, and this is, again, a really highly uh, cross-disciplinary project. And what we're doing is looking at ways to use evaporation of water, evaporative cooling in buildings uh, instead of refrigeration cycles. Uh, and it starts with ceramics, uh, working with the MAPS group at Harvard and Martin Bechtel. We do an incredible amount of work in, in the world of uh, ceramic design. And typically, in this case, holding a terracotta pot, uh, tile, this terracotta is uh, going to absorb water. It's, it's very porous. Uh, and what we've done working with engineers at the school, uh, uh, at the VEAS and the School of Engineering, is we've de developed a nanoscale barrier layer that actually lets us completely shed this water. And we're going to be able to use it to do what's called indirect evaporative cooling. To understand what's happening at the nanoscale, uh, we need to do scanning electron microscopy. We need to actually look at uh, these impossibly small scales that are below the length scale of visible light uh, by bombarding them with electrons to see what's going on. Uh, so these first images, I'm going to start to zoom in just like the power of, of 10 uh, and see what's happening. And this first image is, uh, is a standard section through terracotta that hasn't been treated. Uh, and so we zoom in magnification 200, 500, 1,000 times, 2,000 times, 5,000 times, 10,000 times, and finally 20,000 times magnification. And we can see that the terracotta is extremely porous. And so for evaporative cooling, this is going to be good. It's going to create a porous matrix to hold water. And then at the surface, we'll have a thin film that will evaporate off that water, uh, inducing cooling. Uh, and that's good in a typical env uh, dry environment, uh, but we want to be able to separate out the latent cooling with that evaporation from the sensible cooling to be able to bring cool, dry air into the building without that extra moisture content of a typical kind of swamp cooler. And so what we've developed is this nanoscale barrier layer, and we'll start to zoom in again, 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. 20,000 now at 50,000, I think we get to 100,000 times magnification, we start to see these kind of like uh, uh, carpet-like structure, these little nodules. Uh, and what these are are bomite. We've actually started, we took an alumina sol gel uh, and we've made alumina oxyhydroxide and we've grown crystals on the surface of this material as a, as a nanoscale kind of barrier layer. It's incredibly thin. And, and fundamentally what we've done is we've grown crystals like rock candy. We've We've introduced, uh, in our case, a sol gel solution with alumina. Uh, we induce a certain amount of heat through boiling, and we actually uh, create the self-assembly of these crystal structures on the surface. Uh, and they, again, look something like this. Uh, and what this is, allows us to do is take that very porous media and we'll apply uh, the sol gel in a, in a water format. And we can actually rationally tune within a ceramic body where we can have dry areas and where we can have wet areas to allow for this indirect evaporative cooler that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but really what's happening here is that these little crystalline structures and, and some surface modification we provide uh, work the same way as 
uh, Gomez Adams here on the bed of nails. Uh, he doesn't fall through to his death because the spacing of the nails is at the right dimension uh, for the surface tension of his uh, clothing and his skin to hold him up above it. Uh, and we're doing the exact same thing, but at the nanoscale for vapor barrier. We're creating a bed of nails that hold these water molecules away uh, based off their own surface tension or molecular size uh, and do not let water come into the system. Same idea. Uh, and we've patented and, and are developing it for evaporative cooling. And so many of us know evaporative cooling in the built environment. We've probably seen this exact slide somewhere in our education, uh, looking at the way uh, Egyptians in, in 1300 BC and even uh, the Spanish, the Batiejo, uh, used porous ceramic uh, as a first type of uh, AC, where uh, the water is evaporating on this porous device made out of ceramic, air comes across and it cools the interior. This is great if we live in Phoenix, where it's very dry, that extra moisture content is benefit beneficial, uh, but areas like here in Boston, especially today, uh, it's not beneficial to have that doping of water. So we get cooling, but we also get moisture entering the building. Uh, and so what we're doing with our barrier layer is creating an indirect evaporative cooler. Uh, we have an exchange media. This is gonna be the ceramic with our barrier layer. We're gonna bring the outside air across it it is going to be sensibly cooled by the wet channels where the evaporation is happening within the porous media. And so we'll have cooling of the air coming in. It'll enter the building without that doping of extra moisture. Uh, and then we'll use effectively a working air stream uh, to run that through the evaporative cooling channels. So the entire kind of exchange media will cool off, but we're only gonna bring in uh, dry uh, product air into the space. The wet working air will be released outside the building. And so we've kind of envisioned this, the first iteration of this as this kind of retrofit wall system where we can bring in uh, direct air from the outside. We can improve ventilation. Uh, we create a ceramic heat exchange uh, module using this barrier layer. Uh, and so the, cold air, the air comes in warm, it's cooled in the dry channels. It then gets, some of it gets redirected into the wet channels uh, where we have the evaporation and cooling. Uh, and so ultimately we have what's called a sub wet bulk cooling system where we can cool the, the uh, air down below what a typical direct evaporative cooler would do uh, without again, adding that extra moisture. Uh, and to do this, we first kind of start with some computational fluid dynamics where we're thinking about the sizing of this system. Uh, we started to ask what size should this ceramic block be? Uh, in this case, it, it'll probably take too long to explain, but we're looking at the kind of relationship of form and flow. How closely should the channels be uh, to maximize their cooling uh, for a given flow rate? Uh, and then how can we actually build this relative to the other system components we need to incorporate? Uh, so working with partners in Spain at Samca and Grace Aragon, we actually produce these modules. So we're looking at a terracotta fabrication method of a, a linear extrusion uh, based off the kind of specificity of, of the design we need for cooling, but also what can the manufacturer produce? And so we see the systems here. Each of the mandrels in this case is going to be a channel where either evaporation or dry cool air is coming through. Uh, and we manufacture these blocks. We did this during COVID. It, it was quite uh, extraordinary to get it done, uh, but they shipped us these and these become our heat exchange elements. Uh, and when we have these elements, what we do is we go back and rationally control certain areas. So now we're seeing the barrier layer where we have dry channels, and then we have wet channels where we have not applied our barrier layer. So in the wet channel, we'll have cooling happening. That cooling will conduct over to the dry channel uh, and dry the air in that that enters the building, but without having that moisture transfer. So we're getting cool uh, dry air in the sense of however dry it was when it came in, and we're getting a big bump in our cooling capacity. Uh, so with that in mind, we took this unit and we installed it in house zero, which I shared before. The house has a lab on the third floor that allows us to conduct research on new materials. Uh, and we popped out one of the windows and stuck our unit in there uh, and studied it for a two week period. So uh, we worked with a team. We, we had uh, some backup on a, a forklift or a, a lift to make sure that nothing fell out the window. This is the first time anyone's done this in the building. I didn't wanna be the first person to drop something out of a three story window. Uh, but what we do is we pop open the window, our collaborator from C's, Jack Alvarenga, is kind of showing us the window, uh, working with our other, other teammates like uh, Peter here, we, we make a little module, uh, you can see the unit on the right, uh, we install it by just dropping it in the window, uh, there's the unit itself, again with Jack, my collaborator, uh, and then there it is in the unit. 
the window. And so over two weeks uh, of time, we monitor different things like temperature and humidity and the overall performance of water use and, and electrical use of the system. Uh, and we start to map that out. So we won't get too deep into this, but on the left side is the temperature profiles over three days. Again, we took this kind of three-day chunks over a two-week period and the humidity. Uh, and so in this case, the takeaway is quite good. Uh, we, we show that we bring in dry air. So the actual absolute humidity of the air coming in does not increase more than a gram. So this is actually saying that fundamentally the system works. We're not inducing more kind of clammy, moist air coming into the building using indirect evaporative cooling. Uh, we do a great job of cooling. We get about 1,500 watts uh, or about uh, 5,000 BTUs. This would be the equivalent of kind of sticking a kind of standard AC unit in the window. Uh, but in this case, we're not using vapor compression. We're just using the evaporation of water. Uh, we're highly effective. This term would take uh, half the time to explain, but we have a wet bulb efficiency upwards of 180%, meaning that if wet bulb is the limit uh, of how well a typical evaporative cooling system can work in direct evaporation, we get upwards of almost 180% of that potential. Uh, this is kind of quite, quite good for the way that we're redirecting the air in the system. Uh, that effectiveness also means that we have a high COP above 10. So for every watt of energy we put in, we can get upwards of 10 watts of thermal energy out. A typical AC unit is around three to four, meaning we also use about 35 or 75% less energy for the equivalent amount of cooling uh, that the AC unit behind uh, these, the graphic shows. And then the last part of this is we use a really small amount of water. We use about a liter of water per hour to achieve that cooling. We're fundamentally about using about 90% of the capacity of our, of our water for cooling. So it's a really kind of highly effective system given the porous media and the way that we're using it. Um, and so we're pretty excited. The, the, there's been a lot of coverage on this about new technology, and this will start to feed into the last part of the talk about where this technology is going relative to a startup. Um, but we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the last technology, uh, and this is dry screen. So the whole conversation we just had, uh, or, or I had to you all, we'll have the conversation later, but this was all about using the evaporation of water as a means of sensibly cooling. Uh, dry screen is taking on the other aspect of water in the air. Uh, and that's saying, how do we dehumidify? How do we take care of that other 33% of our emissions uh, related to cooling uh, by dehumidifying without a typical vapor compression cycle or costly uh, liquid desiccants? And, and dry skin is a vacuum membrane dehumidification system uh, that I'll explain in a second. Uh, but a typical vapor compression system uh, inherently dehumidifies because as we pass uh, air across the coils of that system on the evaporator side, we're going to have water condensate because we're driving it down below the dew point. Uh, and we have to, to do the, to do a typical dehumidification, uh, we have to actually uh, super cool our air. We condensate the water out of the air, and then we bring the air up to the temperature we want by mixing or other means. Uh, and so we are asking, how can we do this dehumidification without vapor compression, without the refrigerants associated? Uh, and so again, we look at this kind of translational research. And in this case, my colleague was looking at membranes for the purpose of filtration with different kind of biological or waste streams. And we said, you know, could we use this to actually suck through vacuum uh, water molecules directly out of the air? Uh, and this system wasn't perfect for it, but we had a lot of know-how. Uh, and eventually we developed a relationship with the manufacturer of, of a, a certain co-block polymer. It's about a 200 to 550 micron thin film. And this co-block polymer has a certain water solubility that's going to be helpful for us. So what we do is we pass air pass, uh, across this uh, water-soluble membrane, this co-block polymer, it's going to absorb a certain amount of water molecules and reject out oxygen and nitrogen molecules uh, because of these hydrophilic channels. We then pull vacuum. We pull vacuum below the partial pressure of water vapor, so we create a potential across that system, and we extract out that water. So in this case, instead of the typical vapor compression cycle, we have an isothermal dehumidification. We are quite literally just sucking water out of the air uh, before it goes into the building uh, without any added heat or cooling in the system. 
Uh, and we've developed a certain amount of IP around different ways to create a porous media to maximize the extraction of the system. Uh, but with the DOE call, uh, we developed kind of a passive, I wouldn't say passive, a naturally ventilated uh, system where we're looking at a retrofit solution where the, the leading idea here is that we don't necessarily need to cool if we can dehumidify the space and provide fresh air. So here the idea is we're gonna retrofit uh, a series of tiles that have our membrane system on them. We're gonna have natural ventilation uh, and buoyancy in the building drive air across these tiles. We'll dehumidify them. We can bring in a warmer temperature air that's been dehumidified and provide the equivalent amount of cooling uh, that a typical AC unit would produce. Uh, and so in the lab, we've done an incredible amount of research around the different materials and membranes. Um, and we tested the smaller systems uh, just as a sense of the science going into this. Uh, and so we started a very small scale testing and, and maximizing the system. I uh, won't get into it too deeply, but we pull out an incredible amount of data to show that the combination of the materials we use, these specialty membranes, and this kind of unique geometry, again, a, a form-fitting flow at a near molecular le level, uh, means we can optimize the water extraction rate of our system. And so with that information in hand, we made a modular system uh, composed of about 60 of these tiles, all under vacuum, uh, and we boxed it up. Uh, for the DOE call, and we shipped it down to Miami uh, December about a year ago or more, uh, and we found a humid climate where we could test it. And so again, this is a retrofit solution like the others, uh, and so we're looking at a 1950s construction on Miami's campus, uh, and we're saying, looking at how much dehumidification can this system produce. Uh, so we installed it right next to its competitor, an old AC unit. This building was meant to be naturally ventilated, and over time, it was closed up. Uh, and instead we opened the window and provided this kind of modular prototype here. Uh, the pump for vacuum is down on the left. It's a pretty big pump for what we're doing. Uh, there's optimization there. And on the right is a refrigerant system. This is just the way we actually measure the water yield uh, over time. And we measured it in a, on the left side in a natural ventilation configuration and the right side in a forced ventilation configuration. Um, we won't get into too much detail here, uh, but over a course of many days, we're able to show that the system did in fact dehumidify. Uh, we're able to pull upwards of about four grams of, of water per kilo, uh, kilogram of fresh air out of the system. And at peak times, we were able to reduce the relative humidity by 50% uh, while it's in place. And all of this means that uh, the system when maximized, has an incredible amount of water capturing capacity, upwards of about uh, maybe four liters uh, of water could be captured if we took a one square meter uh, a window and placed our membranes and our tiles in it. Uh, and so that's a, a pretty interesting amount of water capture, four liters per hour, I have to be clear. Uh, and so not only are we dehumidifying, but it's a really kind of interesting pathway for other technologies that might want to use it as water capture. Uh, what this also means is that we have a highly efficient system uh, if we build it out very large. When we installed it in Miami, our COP, the amount of energy we're putting in electrical wise versus the amount of water in terms of vaporization we get out was just above one. So not great, but the theoretical models, if we were to build this out larger, show that we get a COP uh, above six and a uh, moisture removal, which means how many kilograms of water per kilowatt hours of about 10. So we could, in theory, for every kilowatt of hour of energy we put into it, we could get about 10 kilograms of water out. And so the major conclusion from this is that we then took this system and compared it to that same AC unit in Miami. And we show that uh, by having some amount of sensible cooling, which we would use, we'll explain in a second, using other systems like an evaporator, uh, our evaporative cooling system, we can drive down the actual cooling demand by about 53%. But what gets more interesting here um, is that now that we have a cool, or a, sorry, a dry air coming in, we can get far more effective in terms of the uh, amount of sensible cooling we need because we show at a higher airspeed at 78 degrees Fahrenheit and 84 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, we can feel comfortable, we can be within an ASHRAE's kind of uh, adaptive comfort standards uh, and, and not need the typical sensible cooling in that space, driving down the, the cooling demands by 70 to 82%, because now we're just bringing in fresh air that is dry and our bodies are going to reject heat to that environment and we're going to feel cool. 
Uh, and so it was a, a kind of major takeaway. Uh, and to wrap, I'll talk about kind of what we're doing now because we have these two technologies. And if you're playing along at home and have some sense of what I'm talking about, there's a lot of information being thrown at you. Uh, these two technologies naturally want to go together. Uh, and so what we're launching at Harvard is a, a new technology, a new company called Vesma. Uh, and what Vesma is, is it's combining the best of both worlds. It's actually taking the indirect evaporative cooling and combining it with dry screen. So what we're going to end up doing uh, in the pink side is we're going to first dehumidify that air using dry screen. So we're going to have a less humid air that then is being introduced to our indirect evaporative cooler, uh, which is going to mean that the evaporative cooler is going to perform better, but it also means we're going to bring in less humidity. And that also means ultimately that as much as we showed that dry screen works well in Miami, uh, we tested our system in Boston uh, for the evaporative cooling system. It's going to fundamentally mean that evaporative cooling, indirect evaporative cooling uh, with dry screen can be applied in any climate. Uh, we really, when we tested dry screen or sorry, uh, cold snap in Boston, uh, it was a very humid period of time. This was last August when we had this incredible heat index. Uh, and yet we still got cooling out of the system. But now if we can dehumidify that airflow before we, we bring it into the evaporative cooling system, we're going to get that much more power out of it, and we're going to be that much more comfortable. Uh, so ultimately, the system looks something like this. We first uh, uh, dehumidify uh, with the vacuum membrane system, uh, and then we cool uh, with the indirect evaporative cooler using the, the C-SNAP technology. And what this allows us to do is one, uh, we have a kind of three degree of freedom cooling system. We can start to dehumidify, we can start to do cooling, and we can just bring in ventilation based off the needs uh, of the space we're cooling. So we have this ability to kind of optimize the energy use around the different kind of needs of cooling uh, in the building. We also have the ability to kind of more effectively cool that wet bulb efficiency. We can speed up or slow down the air based off the amount of dehumidification we want or total cooling we want. And that means that we have a really kind of high COP. Uh, the, the evaporative cooler gets a COP of about 14. Uh, the dehumidifier maybe as low as four, uh, but combined the total system has a, a COP of at least six, uh, which is at minimum uh, twice as good as a typical AC unit. And again, within these different degrees of freedom, we can improve uh, that cooling capacity. And when we start to improve that cooling capacity, when we go back and compare the whole system to a standard AC uh, system. If our target is still 70 degrees uh, C, or sorry, 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the building, about 21 degrees C, uh, over the uh, same period of time, in this case in Miami, we show that we can get about a 70% energy reduction by combining dehumidification, evaporative cooling, and natural ventilation throughout the year and matching when we use uh, these different systems. Uh, and so where we're at with this technology is, again, we are launching a company. Uh, this is a crazy image of what we're building in the lab right now, combining these, these technologies. I show it mostly for the uh, satisfaction of wires and chaos and showing that we're continuing to prototype these systems. Uh, but in about two days, we're actually going to take uh, this unit and install it back in house zero and once again prove out that these technologies will work uh, and that we can do cooling without the use of refrigeration really drawing down the carbon emissions uh, related to our cooling tech um, and so again this is a team effort there's a lot of people that are involved uh, many of them are listed here uh, but it is a very collaborative environment and i'll, I'll end here uh, and it looks like we'll have plenty of time for questions as well So I can stop share and, and pull the slides back up if we need to. A, a major download, so uh, happy to kind of clarify anything that, that people need. Hey, uh, I think you have a question or two in the chat. Can you see that? Yeah, this is uh, for the Birdo question. Yes. Yeah, this is a, a pretty interesting question. I am not, a, so the question is, uh, has the research help inform Boston Birdo and, and Cambridge Budo? I'm not sure if I'm saying that one right, uh, regulations. Um, it is tied to it. So we actually had a proposal, uh, my colleague, Holly Samuelson, probably a great speaker, she hasn't already spoke uh, with the BSA, 
is uh, a little deeper into these standards. And we are looking, of course, at the impact of uh, carbon emissions related to the embodied carbon of buildings within these different standards. Uh, but I'll be frank in saying that we haven't really informed either one of those two policies uh, related directly to this research, uh, though we are looking at them uh, in, in a sense of what type of trade-offs do some of these systems uh, provide relative to the full life cycle carbon emissions uh, and how might they start to be kind of part of the incentive or disincentive plans of those uh, regulations. That's it. Hey, I'm, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, these, so far, these uh, are, of course, experimental units, and they seem to be at residential scale. And I'm wondering uh, how are you, uh, you, you must have thought at some point about how you might scale these up. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think a big part of it is the kind of market fit when we're thinking about this Vesma uh, company launching. Uh, and one of the really kind of fascinating aspects is uh, that the system has to use water, right, for the evaporative cooler. And so at a residential scale, uh, if, if we think about this as something that might actually sit inboard uh, kind of a standing unit, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily work uh, because there's a question of how would you bring water to uh, the system? How would you plumb it? Uh, that's a question that a typical AC unit doesn't have. We just have to plug it in. Uh, but that plumbing also becomes a, a really unique market opportunity where because we don't use any refrigerants, we're not uh, bound to the typical uh, contractors that are, are required to be certified to install uh, refrigeration systems. So we can actually start to market to a different group, to plumbers and contractors. Uh, and so what we're looking at is kind of a mid-sized commercial unit that could be a through wall system or a rooftop system, not like the massive housing, uh, but something that could uh, deliver some uh, up to like five tons of refrigeration. So as we launch, we're really focused on the, uh, the small scale commercial. Oh, we lost Jeff. He should be back soon. I um I was just typing um uh, a question uh, but since um it's faster if I just ask uh, verbally. Um, yep. I'm just wondering um uh, the eva eva evaporative cooling units um it's a wonderful alternative to the um window AC. Um, so I because there's so much information that we're trying to digest. Uh, I yeah. just to understand, um, do, do you, so it does not draw any energy at all. It's complete, it's a passive cooling system. It's not, it's not passive. We have to, um, the energy going in is for fans to blow air across the system uh, and for a water pump uh, to irrigate the wet channels. Uh, and so if we think about this kind of the ability for our particular unit to reach up to about 1500 watts of cooling, uh, we use about uh, under 140 watts of electrical input uh, to blow the fans to provide a pretty high CFM, uh, a high amount of, of air, uh, and then to incrementally or not incrementally, be uh, periodically uh, we spray water down the channels and the pore ceramic allows us to kind of uh, minimize that duty cycle, that, that period of time that we have a sprayer on and off uh, to provide the, the, the thin film we need for evaporation. I see. Thank you. Yeah, so good question from Eric. Would the, this technology for dehumidification and cooling work on indoor air alone? I assume it may be more efficient to keep fresh air deliver, uh, delivery separate from conditioning. So um, yes, I mean, it's always best to, you know, to retain the amount of cooling energy we've produced. Uh, and so with the product we're launching, we're looking at ways of, of recapturing uh, and we'll have, um, we'll recapture some of the interior air and mix it with the fresh air coming in and have the ability to have a completely, uh, um, 
isolated system where we're just regenerating uh, the interior air, uh, but we are keen on the need for uh, improved ventilation in buildings. Uh, one could see that, uh, especially on the dehumidifier, it could be a, a standalone system in, on the interior to uh, dehumidify, but um, for this particular launch, we're focusing on the combined evaporator and, and dehumidifier. Uh, Kylie, if I'm saying that right, is the water pump a closed loop? Um, so in evaporative coolers, we have um, a couple of different ways. So the water pump is, yes, a it's not a closed loop if we think about a typical evaporator that sits on the roof, where we might have a, an exchange media running through uh, metal tubing, and then we have water dropping on that to cool. Um, and then that, ref that cooling media then goes to an exchange or somewhere else in the building. Uh, but in this case, uh, the, the pump is in a closed loop in the sense that we irrigate the channels uh, and we have a well at the bottom that we then recirculate using that pump uh, to uh, recirculate the water in, in those channels but inherently within uh, any type of evaporative system, we're gonna lose water uh, through the process of evaporation. Uh, we have a blowdown configuration, so it helps with some of that, uh, but ultimately it's fundamentally an open loop. Uh, following up on that, on the uh, will the equipment and small commercial applications uh, will need to be ducted to separate rooms? If so, will that affect the results? Um, yeah, there'll be a certain amount of pressure loss in the system, and therefore the pump would have to work, or the fans and blowers work harder. Uh, so your COP drops with that extra resistance. Uh, right now, we're looking when we think about like a rooftop or a, a through wall system, we're looking at kind of direct application to the space. Uh, but in theory, this kind of cooling plant could be ducted uh, throughout the building, uh, and then we just need to size those fans properly to the resistance loss through the ducted system. I have a question. Uh, obviously, the technical side of this is very complex, but um, if I understood correctly, the CSNAP uses about a liter of water per hour. Is that correct? And then the dry screen could pull four, up to four liters of water uh, out of the air per square meter. Isn't there a way to optimize those two so you don't have to plumb them? Yeah, that's like uh, the perpetual motion machine that the thermodynamicist in me does not... Uh, <laughs> We, we do get that question and, and that that's the, the dream, um, but there's always heat loss in a system. Um, and so the physics of it is that because we're pulling a, a water molecule under vacuum, that water molecule inherently expands uh, and then we release it to the atmosphere, which is at higher pressure and it compresses. And that compression operation, there is some heat generated that's going to happen. And the theoretical model would say that that heat is extremely large. Uh, in our system, it's around uh, 45C. The, the pump itself is a heat exchanger. Um, and so the vapor comes off at a warm temperature. Uh, and the question is, how would you then condense it and capture it? For this system, uh, we're rejecting it to the environment for now as a kind of simple solution. Uh, but within our kind of canon of research, we're thinking about ways of bringing that temperature down and, and harvesting it. So in, in an ideal case, one could imagine that uh, the well that I spoke about in, in terms of the water evaporating, that could be an exchange area where we, we can condensate out the water vapor because it's at saturated, et cetera. It will condensate at a very high temperature. Um, but at this research stage, I, we love that idea, but we like won't commit to it because it just, <laughs> I feel like it's, it's selling uh, something that is going to be a little more difficult than it seems. Uh, but that is the kind of, that would be the hope of a system of this nature. Uh, but I, I just can't commit to it. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Uh, so Eric asking, will you be testing the system on a, a separate enclosure where the effectiveness can be evaluated as the complete system? Uh, I want to probably not 
gonna fully understand the question, but when we test the system in house zero again, we have both systems running together, C-SNAP, the evaporator, and uh, dry screen, the dehumidifier. And so we will be looking at the effectiveness of those two systems together. Um, but, uh, so we, we will know the effectiveness of the complete system and the way that we can kind of fine tune different aspects of it. Um, but again, the, the building environment will have some impact on that given the configuration we're using. Um, but yeah, so so we'll know the effectiveness, but I'm, I'm not fully understanding the question if I'm, if I'm answering it correctly. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of stuff going on at House Zero. So I was wondering yeah. if yeah, it would yeah, be yeah. easier I think to just build a shack somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah I, I thought that's kind of what you're getting at. Um, so the lab itself is quite nice. It can shut it. The lab is designed uh, for this purpose. And so it can be isolated. You can turn off the systems in that lab uh, and only run what you want to. So we will turn off uh, the CO2 sensors so that the windows won't be opening. Um, we're going to effectively eliminate the slab and the radiant cooling in the system. So ultimately, um, we do, it's not a perfect system. There, it would be nearly impossible. Um, but we we do have the capacity to minimize the impact of all those those systems that you are discussing, and then we can use the kind of data uh, backbone that the house has to then monitor our performance uh, alongside all the different uh, sensors that we bring uh, with the equipment. Any more questions? Um, yeah, I'm uh, a question. I might have missed a, a little bit of this. My connection dropped out. But uh, my, am I understanding correctly that the operational energy for this system, the inputs would be air movement for air movement and supplying water? Is that right? So for C-SNAP, it's the fan power uh, to blow the air across the system and the pumping power to, to irrigate or, or uh, spray water into the, the wet channels. Uh, and then on the dry screen side, the power is the vacuum pump. Uh, and that, that, that pump right now, because this is not a conventional use of it, is a pretty high power draw. That's why our infield COP was rather low. Um, but what we're looking at, uh, again, with a launch would be to kind of uh, specially manufacture a pump for this purpose. Um, but those are the, the three inputs on the system plus some, you know, um, computation. So the, the big advantage is, is removing the condensing and evaporating system that's conventional. Yeah, on the energy draw, we're not doing, we're, we are doing the work in terms of the vacuum. You can think about it as a compressor, uh, but on the, for just sensible cooling, we're not doing the work of a typical vapor compression system. So we don't have that energy draw. And then when we really think about the full life cycle emissions of this project, uh, we don't have those refrigerants, which can be, uh, you know, typical uh, R314 is, um, is uh, a thousand times more potent than CO2, 1500 times. So the life cycle emissions of this project are much lower. Great. Well, we wish you the, the best of luck with your venture. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I appreciate everyone's questions. I know it was a big kind of data and uh, engineering dump, but hopefully, uh, you know, some of it was understood. So I appreciate the time to share this with everyone. Yeah, it sounds very promising. And it's great that you uh, can do some real world testing uh, and make it part of an educational experience. I think that's yeah. great. Absolutely. Okay. Thank so, you, excellent, amazing content. Yes, thank you. Very best of luck on the, on the next steps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you have any anything else to add? No, no I, I think we're good. And um, 
we are we are two minutes um we have two minutes um left so uh, we might give it back to the audience and just um the last thing is to thank you Jonathan once again it's wonderful for coming and sharing with us um the, the new product that's available it's it's always good to know what what what's um what can what comes ahead and what might be in front, ahead of you um, so so thank you uh, for sharing um, and thank thank you everyone for attending the seminar this is great uh, please join us again next month by uh, September on the third Tuesday if you could um, and the CE credit um, if you need the CE credit please click on the link it's been posted on the chat um, and that's all um, uh, have, have, a, have a great day and have a wonderful afternoon.